Now in our final segment, we are going to evaluate Sierra Leone's presidency at the United Nations Security Council from 1st to 3rd, uh, to 31st, pardon, August this year, among other things. And this morning, joining us to discuss this, we have Abdul Fatoma, who is Chief Executive um, campaign, um, Chief Executive Officer, Campaign for Human Rights and Development International Charity. Fatoma was also at the United Nations Security Council where he addressed the council on a topic deep seated divisions threatening Sierra Leone's democracy. And uh, we are also expecting Abubakar Ju Sisei, um, National Outreach Coordinator, Ministry of information and civic education. Good morning, Abdul. Welcome to the program. Good morning, and thanks for having me. It's it's a pleasure. What are the highlights of this year's, you know, um, presidency of Sierra Leone? You know, heading the council, Security Council. I mean, yeah, um, it's such a symbolic thing for Sierra Leone as a small country. And if you look back, uh, you and I, we are now around mm -hmm. back in 1971 when we first assumed that. So it's like uh, over 50 years you know, ago. And we return them back as a smaller country and a country that has benefited a lot from the UN Security Council resolution mm -hmm. you know, in terms of passing a resolution for us to have a peacekeeping mission, passing a resolution for us to have a trend partnership in setting up um, the accountability system in Sri Leone, like the, the special court for Sri Leone, who try those who bear greatest, greatest responsibility for our civil war. And why is we assume this seat, the 1st of August to the 31st of August, uh, we try to leverage that position on canvassing around injustice that has happened to us Africans you know, well back in 1945, immediately after the, the Second World War, mm -hmm. United Nations was set up. And when the United Nations was set up, we, I mean, the UN, you know, was trying to maintain peace and also place sanction mm -hmm. on country that disregard, you know, UN resolutions and uh, the, the council will put out a resolution that is legally binding on member states. So the placement of the injustice happened right there. Why is most African country back in 1945, Sierra Leone is included, we were under British colonial system and so many other African countries were under the, the British rule, I mean colonial system or other European countries. Mm -hmm. So. Now we have moved from 1945. So other countries have been asking. They want more, you know, um, seat, increment in seat. This is the very first time a country have put forward an item on the UN Security Council agenda asking the gatekeepers to give away for Africa to have two permanent seats. I mean, we could have asked for more. Yeah. You're thinking about 54 states. But we are still moderate in our request. So it is a huge sacrifice for me, from my own point of view, for a country like Sierra Leone. Instead of putting other agendas, you know, personal agendas, and we more leverage on the, the, the two permanent seats and increase it on non-permanent seats. Mm -hmm. And then Sierra Leone also used the opportunity to highlight their interest in peace and security. And uh, it was captured globally, and a lot of countries support that. And we make a case that we're coming from a war and a post-conflict country, uh, a country that have maintained peace after civil war. But then for me, there is a balance in there. The reality on the ground mm -hmm. does not reflect on what we have done at the global stage. And what needs to be done by the government of Sri Lanka is to ensure that the way we have positioned ourselves as a country at the global stage, that reflects back home to the lives of our people. Because I, I, I noticed you presented um, 
uh, a particular case to the UN Security Council about you know, deep-seated um, divisions in Sierra Leone, democratic instability and the likes? No, I, I made that posting before ever I traveled to New York. Okay. But then I was also privileged to made a statement, mm -hmm. you know, um, at the uh, UN Security uh, Council um, delegate entrance, you okay. know, alongside the president, the deputy UN Secretary General, and uh, other personalities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I also urged the United Nations to think about peace and the drivers of peace, and also if they're making any policy provision they should ensure that women and children are safe in that frame, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, processing of policies for mm -hmm. global peace, and also <coughs> ensure that countries, member states, including Sierra Leone, you know, of the United Nations, should ensure that civic space is guaranteed mm -hmm. and for citizens actually to participate with our governance. Coming back home, it has been a while. We have been deprived of protesting. And these are one of our democratic uh, principles as a as, as, as country or as people living in a democratic society. Mm -hmm. So uh, my organization applied, requested by law, notified the Australian police that we wanted to protest against the Ministry of Technical and Higher Education for something we believe they overuse their power and we consider that as an abuse of power by dissolving the university court. The police vehemently refuse us not to protest, even though they ask for prescription. We, we prescribe the place that we want to protest hmm. and we gave them time. They called us to meeting twice and the best they could do to us is to deny us our fundamental right, our God-given right. And if we are talking about peace and security, there are some fundamental principles that citizens need to enjoy. It. And so with that, I was there sounding the drum, reminding the United Nations and United Nations you know, state members that if you are here, making policy, we are asking United Nations for a reform. Please help us reform the systems that are going on in our different countries. How, 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 how do they go about doing that? Like what? To help in reforming our systems, for example, in Sierra Leone. Uh, well, we are part of uh, United Nations, and if we have conventions that have passed by the United Nations mm -hmm. and we have signed some of those conventions and we have ratified and some have been domesticated and some we have just signed them without even ratifying them. I mean, if the United <coughs> Nations they themselves are very serious about reforming themselves and also helping their member states to reform, to work within the confines of democratic principles, I mean, you need to be in line with what you are here for, shouting, signing. This month, we'll be having the Future of the Summit back in New York. We will be having the monarch, uh, prime ministers, you know, presidents, heads of state. They will be there making speeches. Hope that this month event will create a momentum in New York to have changed the way the UN think, to have changed the way the UN perceived, you know, uh, uh, smaller countries or continent. So basically, if we are signatory to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we are signatory to the International Covenant on Civic and Political Rights, the International Covenant on uh, um, Political and Cultural Rights. I mean, these are rights that we should enjoy as citizens. So if Sierra Leone is a signature to it, UN should ensure that if you are state party members and you are not ensuring that your citizens enjoy the fulfillment of their fundamental rights, 
you know, we will start giving you, you know, some systems. So that's the reason why, holistically, civil society organization, I'm part of the UN uh, ECOSOC for 10 years now. We have been pushing the UN General Assembly at ECOSOC level to ensure that we have a reform and we have an open space between us and our governments, not only in Sri Lanka, globally. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you attend meetings, we are civil society globally made. You know, uh, definitely you will see that we share similar experience, even in the United States, even in the United Kingdom. You know, um, it's clear to see that Sierra Leone is actually in a spotlight. Yeah. I mean, after gaining that um, prestigious status, leading the UN Security Council for a whole month, it's clear to see that, I mean, a lot of people would also want to know, what are we doing back home? And you've just recounted an experience where you wanted to lead a protest. Our organization. Your organization protest, wanted yeah. to lead a protest, and that was denied. And yeah. that's not a one-off case. What's, no. what's the challenge with implementation and the respect of human rights when it comes to Sierra Leone? Well, as a country, we, we are challenged in terms of uh, respecting and implementing um, human rights and uh, the rule of law. Uh, it has been a while. Um, just if you take a look at our constitution, I mean, it doesn't actually give any luxury to you to enjoy your fundamental human rights. Yes, um, there's a chapter three who talked about the fundamental human rights, but then there are also other chapters, like chapter two, who deliberately takes away, you know, um, some of those fundamental rights, like for example, your social rights issues are not justiciable, meaning if your government fails to provide for you your social services, like right to education, right to health, you have no legal rights to take the country to court, you know, in this country. But the good thing for us, we have, you know, a backup, which is the ECOWAS court. And it's quite expensive for most civil society organizations or individuals. Um, just think about it. And you'll be traveling to Abuja. And sometimes a ticket to Abuja will cost more than $1,500 in, in, in economic class. And you have to hire a lawyer. And if you have a lawyer in, in Nigeria, definitely you'll be paying more. And if you also hire a lawyer from Sierra Leone, you and the lawyer will be traveling. So, but locally, you can see some of the challenges that we have. So, hence the reason why we have been calling, you know, on the government of Sri Leone to ensure that we review the constitution, and this constitution should belong to the people of Sri Leone. It should be, it should be the people's constitution. You think it's possible for to have some robust changes in the manner in which we administer democracy in Sierra Leone moving forward. Now, from, you know, unlawful arrests to detentions, you know, unplanned protests, that were, like what we saw last year, you know, when the people became quite aggrieved and agitated and moved out to the streets. Well, someone m might argue that indeed, um, part th partly the reason why that protest happened because of instigation or incitement, if you like, you know, but albeit people were vexed, you know, and disturbed. So the question is, if we are pushing for reforms internationally, these reforms, as you've argued, should reflect locally. Now the question is, how do we do it? We can do it the way we're doing it for it to, to look very good at international mm -hmm. level. We have done a remarkable job as a country. I mean, I was in New York. And I saw um, the big five foreign countries mm -hmm. and ambassador queuing in a line, not sitting down, standing, to get a f two or five minute with the Australian president. Mm -hmm. That's remarkable. Yeah. And uh, it's remarkable because of the achievement we have done at global stage, you know, at international level. And within the space of six years, for us actually to attract this huge global attention, I mean, it's a phenomenal achievement, you know, for this smaller country, uh, for this small country. But then, 
like I said, and you, you repeated it, we weren't um, these envious uh, attraction to reflect back home. Like, I want to see where the police allow me to protest against bad policies, mm -hmm. you know, um, in this administration. And you talked about arbitrary arrest, unlawful detention. I've suffered that in, you know, in 2017. I was arrested just for calling on the parliament to be open and being accountable. And guess what? We benefited from that again as a country. Now, the Open Government Initiative, the OGP, ranked our parliament as one of the most open parliament done. And the thing that I was detained for, mm -hmm. the thing that my passport was confiscated for for 45 days, I was deprived not to see my family, not to see my kids. For 45 good days, I was under life threat in this country in 2017. And, you know, with this administration, we have tried, you know, to protest against something we think is bad. Um, I was receiving threats again, and then I was denied. My organization was denied the right for us not to protest. And we took the matter to court just to, give, to grant us an injunction. It took the judge like 36 days. <laughs> and at the end, he denied us the injunction. He didn't grant us that injunction. And the matter is still there. So we are still in court with the Ministry of you know, um, Higher Education for their actions against the University of Sri Leone. And we are working on multiple cases, and we are also uh, doing a lot of um, uh, data collection you know, on several rights-based and social rights issues. You are quite proactive, you know, not only you, but your organization and what yeah. you do. Um, do you think other civil society organizations have become quite weary, you know, and uh, timid to champion the fight against, you know, the deficiencies that surround democracy in this part of the world? Uh, you see, um, I always say this to people and at many platforms as well. Um, one, we have two types of civil society. Mm -hmm. We have civil society groups that believe in political party agenda, political party ideology. And so they propel their political party agenda or ideologies. And you have civil society that believe in the people and advocate for the people. So you should know the difference when they speak. You clearly withdraw the line. Mm -hmm. And then the other side of it is the poverty in this country has taken away the dignity, the pride of individuals in this country. And the politicians clearly know this. And what they do, they hold the pot that provide resources to civil society organization, either at community level, district level, or national level. So when once they are deprived, they cannot pay their office rent any longer. Mm -hmm. they, they couldn't pay their you know, staff or volunteers. They can't provide stipend for their volunteers. So what happened next? Um, either you precinct or you join the government you know, to say things or defend things against the very people, you know, um, that the civil society sign up to advocate for. So when you look at the economic environment, it has taken away the dignity and pride of citizens in this country. Mm -hmm. And so with that, now, how many of us in this country want to know the vibrancy of civil society and what have kept them quiet and why are they not speaking? Do we have office space for them? 
can somebody with a home offer in civil society, can you use my space in, in the United Kingdom, in the United States, and other European countries or North American countries, mm -hmm. this happened. And so those civil society remain committed to the people. But imagine if a civil society will be paying a rent within $5,000 to up to $20,000. There are civil society that pays office rent to $20,000. And then they don't know funding. Like you look at the United Nations. They don't work with civil society that criticize government. No, no, don't take it. They don't. Hmm. They work with civil society organizations that support government idea because the UN will tell you that we support government initiative. So whenever a new administration comes up, the United Nations Development Program will develop and align their program towards that, that very administration, you know, national development plan. So they align with it. So civil society organizations that are against some of the provision in that national development plan, just kiss your hand and say, bye-bye, I'm not going to be part of UN you know, things. And then there are all the donors who also think that they should be in Sri Lankan politics. So with that, civil society organizations that they have less leverage to control they distance them and even sanction them. So civil society organization is going through a lot. And some of my colleagues cannot speak about those things because m maybe they are afraid. If they criticize, maybe they, they don't know, so either the government, they don't get anything. But we have opportunities outside of Sri Lanka. So it depends on the connectivity or the connection of the individual, the leadership, or the team in that civil society. So there, there is a, a lot of ups and downs when it comes to um, silence. And some mm -hmm. are silence because I mean, you cannot criticize the one that fits you now. Yeah. If somebody is giving you money and then giving you contract, uh, why do you think you will come to AYV and start criticizing that individual? When that contract expires, just forget about the renewal. So, um just as we've been speaking, civil society has actually come under public scrutiny for a long time mm -hmm. with regard to this praise singing and all of it. Mm -hmm. So why do people actually venture into that game when you clearly know if you do not praise sing, which is w what you're not called for, if you do not praise sing, you're not going to get the contract, you're not going to get the recommendations or support you need. So what's the driving factor for civil society? organizations. Uh, uh, let, let me tell you, um, some people venture into civil society, it's not actually with the objective of praise singing. Um, some people have passion from childhood, like I'm one of them, I was at secondary school when, uh, you know, I gained interest for uh, human rights activism because of what I witnessed in this country. And so with that, even when I left this country, went to the United Kingdom and gained my education um, with all what I have, I having worked with global organizations like the UN Global Compact, Global Reporting Initiative and all this, you know, I still decided to hang on on what I believe in. Um, I feel more fulfilled um, with that. Um, I have my networks, I have my connections. So um, I'm in civil society. You don't have a record of me pressing in any government or any politician in this country, you know, throughout a like, challenge and a one. And we have been under the spotlight, yes, that is true. And for some fundamental reasons and some from, from ignorance point of view, because people are ignorant about the makeup of civil society and how civil society operates. And if you want civil society to be functional, to be effective and very, very active, it comes from the support of the public. But here in Sri Leone, we are one of the ignorance of people in Sri Leone about civil society with no disrespect, uh, no apology as, at all, is the fact that when you are running an NGO referred to civil society, you are a rich man. Right? So, but. Every donor gives you funds, 
a few said we're going to hold a focus group discussion and we need 25 people at that focus group discussion and we need uh, food for the 25 people. Even the bottle of water, you have to budget for it and you have to present a receipt before the next tranche is given to you, meaning you have to be accountable for that. So you cannot take a money that doesn't belong to you. And when that happened, the very donor blacklist the civil society. So these are some of the other fundamental reason again why some civil society go back into their shells because if they collect money and they fail to be accountable for those funds to their donor, the donor will withhold, you know, for the support and ensure that they share the name of the organization to all the donors who are focusing on Sierra Leone that, hey, don't give Mr. XYZ money because this organization, they're not good at managing their finance, they have, they have failed to accountable for XYZ amount. And, you know, um, people don't know that coming to civil society, it entails a lot. And some don't have actual counseling, professional, you know, advice. And it's because Jones is running a, an organization, it's making extremely well. You know, uh, Elizabeth thinks that, you know, she thinks that, oh, I, I could. I mean, Jones and I went to the same university, so I think mm -hmm. I have the same capability. And you don't know J Jones' connection, the commitment of his family, or, you know, whatever support from his friend. It will help him to get laptop, will help him to get furniture. And, but you, you don't have no one in your family or neither around your friends are could they will even envy you because you have started attending meetings where ministers sit. Because the moment you are in civil society or the media, you have an open ticket. You know, to attend big events globally. You have the opportunity to sit with presidents, uh, prime ministers. It depends on your network, your caliber. So people start witnessing that as oh man, he's like Elizabeth, she's doing well. She, uh, but financially, you're not doing well because you did not pay for yourself to fly to Brussels or to United Kingdom or to United States. Someone's pays, and maybe that might be the donor. It's not your money. But your friends or your family members will start saying that, oh, well, you are far away better than me because you fly now, you know, all over the world. These are all the ignorance about you know, um, how civil society operates and how it works. So some choose to actually pray sing because, I mean, that's a survival. It happens everywhere. You look now, we lack professionals in this country. You see the lawyers who are supposed to be more professionals. You can see some people can no longer hold you know, their point of a professional position, journalists civil society, you look at the media, the, the, the medical practitioners, you go places and don't even talk about civil servants. For me, they are no longer civil servants because it's all about political party now. You know, they are even the one advising the political appointees hmm. that these people are not with us. You know, they are from this region, they are from that region. We have suffered, you know, in the hands of people that we entrusted, you know, our hope to that they should be professional, but they have failed us. And now, young people who are in universities aiming to be a professional in this country, either in the public service, you know, they, they, they don't have much hope because you have to align either with your region or political party. And this is the divide that I talked about before my travel to, to, to New York, that we are deeply divided. And when there you have politicians who see it differently and want to defend it, that, oh, when we play football match, we shout together, we celebrate new star, that's collective. When you want to mess up with people, insult their family, mm. insult their nationality, insult their tribe, insult their religion, no matter how close you guys are, that will be the start of the war between you and that your best friend. So, a country so when it comes to Sierra Leone, we mm -hmm. are collective in defending and promoting Sierra Leone. You know, for a country that is religiously tolerant, we always um, take that as one of our accolades. Do you think we would ever heal from this divide? Yeah. 
I mean, we should. It, 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 it's easy, but because of lack of trust and insecurity, so we see it's very difficult, but it, it's quite easy. I mean, let's say if Jones goes to Frabe College without joining Oradica, and you happens to be Oradica, and you are that position, and someone who also want to participate with Jones, you know, uh, happens to be Oradica. But Jones happens to be more competent, and he knows the job, and he will deliver. But because Jones happens not to be Oradica, you would frustrate Jones and get your Oradica person to support you, you know, working with you. Why you said it's brotherhood. And it happens with the female organization. They said it's sisterhood. And let's say if we now start to get people based on merit, not based on how connected they are from either Bo School, Maboroka Boys, St. Edwards, Albert Academy, the big schools, mm -hmm. grammar school. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, their past pupils have held, you know, head of state position in this country. We have witnessed that, that the moment in power, most of their previous classmates mm -hmm. or people who attended that school, they will be, if not the majority, they will be closer. Maguroka boys, mm -hmm. the boys from the boys school. So, I mean, <laughs> if you see I'm talking about boys school, so mm -hmm. many. I actually want to be balanced and for the interest of Australia. And St. Edras, during the days of, you know, uh, 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 late President Kaba. Uh, Albert Academy, you look at Sheikha TV. And those days, you look at people who were Salba Maga. So it, it's just like that. We have to stop you know, this school connection, this regional connection, and also the political parties are not helpful to this country. The political parties, if you are a frontliner demonstrating or attacking your political opponent without even the required qualification for certain position, and if the political parties decide to appoint professionals and experts, they're going to say, we don't know who said they even pull and just pull them and I can't put them. But you don't have the requirement. Allow people who have the requirement. So what they will do, they will put pressure on their flag bearer, who happens to be the president then, to be under intense pressure. Everywhere you go, the party is not happy with this government. The party is not happy with this. The party. So these guys are human beings, and they get frustrated and start bringing their party people. And they will sit on that desk, having no clue. So these rogue permanent secretaries and other public service, you know, uh, public people, will have, I mean, public professionals will have in our ministries or our departments, sees advantage over the ignorance of these people who have no clue how to run governance. Okay. Quickly before we join uh, Ransford okay. McLean in our studio too, um, the call for Sierra Leone, oh sorry, Africa, through the presidency in August to have the two permanent seats and additional seats in the non-permanent category at the United Nations Security Council. Do you think that's possible? Because even when you look at how the West reported what happened, all the praises, I would say, were with the UN chief. And little or no mention in some of these media outlets that, you know, it was the president of Sierra Leone in his, in his <laughs> capacity as president of the UNSC who moved that motion. Do you think it's possible? It is possible. It's a matter of time. I mean, the good thing is that that's going to be one of President Bill's very big legacy. I mean, he has now, his name has now been entered into the world history as one of the world leaders or leaders from Africa who boldly sacrificed all the opportunities that we could have gained from being a president for one month, right? Mm -hmm. But he decided to battle for the interests of all Africans, mm -hmm. you know, African continent. And the West, you see, one thing we hear, we don't respect the media. 
how powerful is the media? Indeed. Africans and Sierra Leonean. You know, when I return back, when I return back, I think about seven years, I'm now going to eight years maybe. Um, I learned a lot. And people who share a table with me most time, I said to them, um, the journalists, the media, the people in this country don't actually know the power that medias have. Mm -hmm. In the room, United States recognize and I appreciate Sierra Leone for bringing forward such remarkable, you know, and important agenda. China, Russia, Japan, you know, other African countries. But outside of the room, I was in that chamber, sitting right behind the U.S. ambassador. Outside, when we, when we step outside, what I read and what I listened from the news it's quite different. That's how manipulative hmm. the West can be. Yeah. And do you think the West like us? No, they are our development partners. I always say this to people. If the US government or the British government donate, let's say 20 bi 1 billion pounds to us, it's never free. That money is to assist us to get us indebted. So when a British company wants to come to Sri Lanka, they should have leverage over their counterpart rivals in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. So the money was never free. It was to get us indebted. And so when British company wants to operate in Sri Lanka, we'll put priority on that British company than that of the Chinese, the Americans. <coughs> Okay. Right, Abdul. Um, thank you very much indeed. You see, we are learning and it's knowledge <laughs> being given on diluted knowledge. <laughs> but one thing before we go to McLean, one thing that is quite clear, you know, I think it's, it's only apt moving forward that um, heads of states in Africa, or even Sierra Leone, the president, his ministers, get to realize how important or quintessential the media is. Yeah. I mean, it. it, it, it it wouldn't have cost much. I mean, having one or two, you know, journalists from each of the big media in Sierra Leone, say AYV one, SLBC one, you know, and uh, maybe Sleek one, and you, they are coming to you. Or you have spaces for, you know, hundreds of people exactly. at times. You understand, know, moving to these places. Exactly. How much so the media, which perhaps could have been quite good essential to hammering home your message, you know, globally. The Western press is always slanted. You understand. So it's just natural. It's not only now. You know, when the O.J. Simpson trial was ongoing in those days, the media turned their attention, you know, to that and leaving um, the, the, the carnage that was happening in um, um, Rwanda. You know, they didn't report until later when they turned their eyes there. They focused on the trial of O.J. Simpson. And that's how it is, you understand. Yeah, they do not prioritize. But, but, but coming to that, just yes, short one. Yes, uh, The same public that mm -hmm. you want to educate and yes. affirm, mm -hmm. lack of ignorance. Indeed. They will also say, you are now on the brown envelope of the government. Indeed. And it's important for them. The media house doesn't have the opportunity to fly their reporters to the United States or neither to Brussels or Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. You know, these are the global diplomatic hubs. But when governments start creating that opportunity, people again in this country <laughs> will start saying that you are collecting brown envelopes, so they no longer trust you. And when governments start getting civil society in those things, they will say it again, oh, I mean, they have started receiving, they have sold us, we have no hope. Uh, how do you want to be informed? Do you think a Nigerian you know, outlets going to give you more detailed information like Israel Union yeah. outlet. Oh. No, it's not possible. I want to thank indeed, very much indeed, um, Abdul Fatoma um, from uh, Executive Director, Campaign for Human Rights, um, Development International Charity, who's been speaking to us about the, the astronomical gains Sierra has made at the United Nations Security Council and the need for local transformations here back home.